Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski, and today I get the pleasure of interviewing a very good friend of mine, a guy who I've respected for a really long time, who is a absolute pioneer in the nutrition space. This guy has been leading the CrossFit space for a really long time, and he's transitioned into just helping people truthfully live their greatest life by instructing them with intelligent nutrition principles that align perfectly with my beliefs. And you see Jason Phillips and I dive deep into understanding nutrition and all the parallels that we've been creating um, you know, through the last 20 years of trying to optimize our personal bodies while helping thousands of clients around the world. Uh, Jason is a brilliant, brilliant mind when it comes to understanding what actually goes into changing somebody's body and how it encompasses so much more than just nutrition, right? What goes into your body is important, but how your body uses what goes into your body is so much more important. So we talk about things like the autonomic nervous system, the HPA axis, uh, stress, parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, so many th of these things are, um, you know, guiding our life and influencing the way our mind works, influencing the way our body uses nutrients. So if you're someone who's sitting at home, you know, perhaps having a hard time um, influencing your body and losing body fat or building muscle. You don't want to listen to every minute of this podcast. So Jason and I really get into some really cool stuff toward the end. Uh, and I loved every minute of this podcast. And we get a sneak surprise from a, a little visitor in the middle of the podcast that you're going to hear. So hopefully enjoy the podcast with Jason Phillips. And Jason would absolutely ap appreciate you guys heading over to his website, IN3 Nutrition. He's teaching thousands of coaches around the world, thousands of clients really how to live an amazing life and a body they love by empowering them with a skill set. You know, our missions are very parallel. So hope you enjoy the show with Jason Phillips. Man, I'm, I'm doing a program for CrossFitters because ultimately CrossFitters need strength and stability. Fuck yeah. And what they're doing, what they're doing is they're, they're executing movements without stability and that's what's causing injuries, right? Yep. Well, they also need, they need that, but they need it like at the right times of year too, right? I mean, like yeah. when they're like when they're competing, obviously, like it's it's competition season. It's like it's yeah, like when you guys go. are bodybuilding, right? Like, yeah. listen, like when you're getting ready for a fucking show, like if you're nicked up, like you train through it. But like when yeah. you're when you're off season, like that's when you fix that shit. Like you build the foundation. But that's what crossfitters right. have no concept of. Um, and so you know, even like from the nutrition side of things, we try to periodize that where you know in the off season if you want to make body comp changes, I'm okay with it. You know, if you've done a proper like postseason, right? So like in the athletic world, periodization, postseason is defined by like full movement restoration, uh, you know, hormonal restoration. And, and so like in the nutritional world, we're looking at like hormone restoration, GI repair, and actually getting you back to like some sort of homeostasis. Well, okay, great. Now, if you want to like change your body comp, great. I'll probably let you live in a calorie deficit. Um, because we can control the intensity of your training. Yeah. But when you're in season, man, like when you got these people doing two and three wads, Metcons in a fucking day, and they want to live in a calorie deficit prolonged, like no chance. I, I just, I can't like with any sort of conscience allow them to live in serious calorie deficits. It's just asking for HPA axis dysfunction. Yeah. I and mean, that's the brilliance of it is, is most people are not paying attention to the cyclical nature of, of, training and like what how it should be cycled like hey if you know you have a competition coming up in three months well you know you need to be in a caloric excess and you're in your life so after the contest we're going to intentionally plan you, you, you're going to assume you're going to put on a little bit of body fat during that phase maybe right yep and let okay that's okay and then as soon as we come off then we go into a body composition phase it's great that you get that man dude it's it's essential and and so many people overlook it um and and i mean you know it, it has it has a uh, an application to virtually a anyone that's like looking at their diet, right? Like even the the mom, like the house mom that wants to go and just look good for the beach, like you know, like I know, like if she's not working with a coach, like she's gonna crash diet, like going into going into going to like the beach, and so like coming out of that, like there needs to be at least some sort of maintenance restoration, if not a small surplus. Make sure that you're operating from some sort of like homeostatic balance then it's like all right well let's diet you the proper way this time but there's there's got to be i love that you said like a cyclical nature there has to be like for every single person in every single walk of life uh there has to be periods and phases 
to create long-term sustained success. The biggest problem becomes, you know, most people, it, 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 you probably lived this when you were a kid, right? Every kid during Monday to Friday wants to build muscle. And then Friday night comes around and he goes, <laughs> oh, shit, I want to look good for the bar. So I got to I gotta deprive myself, right? And that's, that's the issue is people, you know, when they're not, when they're trying to build muscle, they're not excessive or, you know, CrossFit or whatever. They're not, they're not you know, eating enough calories. And then when they're trying to lose fat, then they starve themselves. And there isn't like an, an intelligent thought process that allows it to actually be effective and cyclical. It's just like... I'm just going to do what I feel like doing today rather than actually sticking with a plan for any amount of time. Well, it's really interesting, right, that you say that as well because it's like those same people that want to like kind of diet during the week and then have fun on the weekend, like effectively like what they're not building as well is any sort of balance. Like they're they're not building any sort of like balance protocol where it's, uh, I don't know, how do you say it, like – structured to allow like long-term success. I mean, if you were working with a college kid, um, you would probably factor in the fact that he or she is going to have weekends that are in a small surplus, if not, you know, at minimum maintenance. So you would change how you structure their week. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think a lot of people are trying to fit a square peg into a round hole and they're trying to, they're trying to undertake a dietary protocol that is meant to be seven days in duration or, you know, seven days per week. So, every single day, no deviations. And they're trying to create an application of five days on two days off. And the two just don't go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely, man. Regularly, um, you know, if let's say someone has a, a regular goal of, you know, adding muscle or, you know, a competition or something like that. How do you begin to uh, approach, you know, let's say someone starts with you tomorrow and says, you know, Jason, I want to have uh, the ability to perform at my best, regardless of body composition. What what do you what's what's the baseline for your beginning of a program? And are, are we talking are we talking athletic performance? Well, I guess that's an important question. Um, you know, my demographic I yeah. feel is is a more um, for you guys it's bodybuilding, yeah, right? Well, it's a more muscle building focus. Yeah, so I, I think it's different, right? So if you're let's give both examples. I think it's really important. Um, you know, if, if we're in like the CrossFit world, which was kind of like my first claim to fame, if you will, yeah. you know, first thing we're going to look at there is we're actually going to look at like the whole individual because I don't care how much I feed you to quote unquote fuel you. If your insulin sensitivity sucks, you're just going to end up putting on body fat and not optimally using the carbohydrates, right? So even if I'm giving you enough fuel, it's not going to be great. But also, if there's some underlying hormonal issues from you having overtrained, from you having overdieted, um, overstressed, not really understood recovery, that has to also be addressed on the front end. Because again, no protocol is going to work on a foundation that is destroyed. And and then that's kind of like where we carry that over to like the bodybuilding world. You know, I mean, you know, if you're working, I'll use myself as an example, dude. Like when I was 18, I was anorexic. Well, coming out of anorexia, my hormone levels were destroyed. Like I had the testosterone levels of a 90-year-old male. Well, if you and I sat down and you're like, Jay, here's your program, and you had no uh, no history on me, and you didn't know I was anorexic, and you didn't know that I had fucked up testosterone levels, then what you're giving me may not be working as well as you think it should, and then we'd be left investigating. So I think it always comes down, man, no matter what the prescription is, it comes down to a conversation with the individual, figuring out who they are, understanding their history, understanding what makes them tick. You know, I think, uh, you know, Paul Quinn used to talk about like personality typing inside of training. I think there's some validity inside of personality typing with, with nutrition as well. Yep. Um, you know, you got to know, Dude, I had a client that literally could not get like could not give up Friday and Saturday nights out. And so it was either we parted ways and she undertook some starvation diet or like we kind of got back and we just built a protocol that it at least mitigated what she was doing Friday, Saturday without sending her down a, a rabbit hole. And it's just, dude, without the, the coaching aspect and without really understanding what made her tick – uh, we never would have come to that conclusion. There's some really interesting um, theories around that stuff. There's a 
um, one particular psychologist that comes to mind that's kind of prototyped, um, you know, different types of psychological modalities that, you know, either you're someone who can be a moderator or you're someone who has to, you know, either do it cold turkey. And, you know, understanding that from a coaching perspective is extremely valuable because you know, ultimately I know that everyone has different psychology and, and what is someone's psychological trigger and what is their belief system about who they are. All, all that stuff has to come into yeah, play if you're a effective dude. coach, right? Oh, yeah. I did. I completely agree. I always say, and you know, obviously we have an education platform and it's like, I always teach our coaches that you're not really even playing the game on the front end of nutrition. You're playing the game of human connection. Yep. And it's not until it's not until you conquer human connection that you can effectively move into nutritional prescription. Um, and, and it's because you have to earn that trust. Uh, you know, you're, you and I are so similar, dude. Like I know you just pick the brain of everybody that you can speak with because you're just always in that constant state of knowledge and and uh and i'm in like that same conquest right i always just want to learn more um and, and so we tend to be like a, a skeptical trusting i guess is like the way to describe it right yeah like like we trust you and like we'll take it at face value but there's always some skepticism not because we don't trust you but just because we want to know more and or 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 you're looking at it from like a different application, right? Like what, yes. you know, what may be true to you may not be true to me. So I say, oh, that's true to Jason, but that may not be true to me. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Knowing the so, one. yeah. And, you know, I mean, because we have that foundation of we want to trust people, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have been burned by what the fitness industry has been putting out the last 10 to 15 years, which is templated garbage, you know, um, and and things that are dude i always quote like muscular development i remember like when george farrow was like the big guru and the headline said carbs are back <laughs> and i was like where the fuck did they go you know like right like uh, they like disappeared and all of a sudden we have carbs back in our life and i'm like you know but because of this right and now you know keto is getting really popular again and, and it's it's even the nutrition industry is cyclical in nature and no, keto was never bad and it was never God's gift to the world. It has its validity in very specific applications and, you know, high carbohydrate, low fat diets were never the devil and they, they were never the greatest thing in the world, but they have their validity in certain applications. And so, but because people and because the media paint this myopic picture that it's all or nothing inside of one protocol, people are so broken. Uh, and then they come to us. It's like we really have to, uh, we really have to kind of like learn them. Um, one thing you brought up, man, I think is a relevant rabbit hole that will go down. And probably the the greatest um, area of focus for today is hormonal issues. And you know, we talked about um, people overtraining, people under dieting, people, um, you know, uh, negatively impl- impacting their HPA axis. Um, what are some of the um, Let's say someone is um, massively overtrained in a massive caloric deficit. What are some of the um, actual physiological uh, experiences that are going to be taking place that are going to start downregulating the hormones from your experience and just to educate our, our listeners? So, I mean, like when we start digging inside of like the body, I mean, you're seeing a reduction first in metabolic hormones, right? So we're talking, you know, changes in leptin, ghrelin, peptide YY. Um, you know, and then all of a sudden we just start going deeper, right? Cause then now all of a sudden we've got sex hormone manipulation, right? Testosterone levels in females, testosterone, estrogen ratios being all over the place. Uh, now we're talking about excess cor- like you know, cortisol being elevated all the time, um, causing pregnenolone steel, causing the inability to, you know, produce DHEA. So your DHEA to cortisol ratio is off, um, which is where, you know, a lot of people classically uh, use the DHEA to cortisol ratio to define the ever so controversial term adrenal yeah. fatigue. Um, but, you know, internal, it's all of those things that are happening that are, you know, really they're all modulated by, you know, the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And so that's where we get the HPA axis dysfunction. And that's where that term, I think, is actually becoming a little bit more commonly accepted. Do you, do you think it's just the body kind of going into this fight or flight mechanism where, um, you know, this person just doesn't have enough calories, so it has to it has to start mobilizing nutrients to start just keeping your cortisol elevated perpetually, plus you're adding on top of that the, the chronic stress of day-to-day life, and yet on top of that, your training. Is it just this, this you know, constantly elevated cortisol state that people live in that's that's ultimately leading to all these dysfunctions? Yeah, well, if you looked at lab values, I think it, that's 100% what it is. But in the beginning, it's chronically elevated cortisol, right? And then over time, if you looked at like a, an adrenal fatigue curve, 
you know, as you're, as you're entering stage three adrenal fatigue, cortisol is very elevated. Um, but like when you hit like stage four, or like that really like shit phase, uh, you basically have the inability to produce cortisol. Um, so it, it's kind of where you're at inside of that game. But yes, it definitely starts with chronically elevated cortisol in, in exactly, I mean, to the word, how you described it. Uh, you know, it's, it's meeting the demands of the stressors that you're imposing on your body on the physical sense. So you're training, um, you know, calorie deficit is obviously a stressor and then obviously the additional stressors of just Western civilization. And then you leave that running with, with no recovery stimulus. So not enough sleep, excessive caffeine, not enough calories, not enough breaks from training, not properly structured training. Well, now all of a sudden your body can't even produce the cortisol to meet the demands of the stressors that you, that you are imposing or that just your life is imposing. What are some of the um, effects of stage four adrenal fatigue when somebody stops producing cortisol? Oh, dude, <laughs> I mean, if we're talking like physical, what you would experience, I mean. Yeah, what would you experience? Yeah. So this is where this is where people are going to, first of all, they have a, an impossible time getting out of bed. Um, you know, when they do get out of bed, excessive caffeine intake in the morning, which really becomes more of just a habitual ritual. Um, if you will, and not so much to, to even move them forward. Um, I think caffeine, a caffeine is, is like, if you're lucky, right? Yes. Most guys, most people in our, unfortunately in our day and age are like, no, let's take a fat burner. Exactly. Let's take a Ritalin. Let's take whatever it is to get through the day. Yeah. Caffeine is like the, the, the best case scenario. Or they're, or they're washing cases. their fat burners down with coffee. Um, yeah. and you know, I've never, I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> I may have tried that once or twice. Uh, in college. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, I might have lived there for a while when I was a bodybuilder. <laughs> yep. So, but yeah, man, so it's, you know, it starts there, but then, you know, obviously the dreaded mid afternoon crash. And yeah. then of course there's the, uh, then there's like the sleep issues, right? So you'll get in bed at night tired yet. You'll lay there wide awake thinking about everything. And I had a really good example of this. Like I actually had a client talking to me two days ago and um, she's like, I literally, she's a nutrition coach as well. And she's like, I literally went through all 50 of my clients and second guessed myself on all of their prescriptions because I was just so like overly anxious. Now she's not really like in adrenal fatigue, but this is where she had just been burned for like 48 hours. Cortisol had been through the roof, inability to recover. Um, and so you start to see things like that, but on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, it's we call it tired and wired you're tired yet you you present yourself as being wired so you have an inability to sleep your sleep is very fractured um and that's just like the surface level shit man but then you go deeper you have an inability to focus you have mood swings all over the place you have no sex drive you have no desire um no memory everything negative you can imagine yeah i mean your memory is gone like anything negative you can imagine that's happening because again it, it's all modulated in that hpa axis uh, and it's just, uh, I, I can speak firsthand because I've been there. Um, you know, I made my own mistakes when I first uh, used CrossFit as my training. And I did what every early CrossFitter does, which is every workout under the sun. And I handled my nutrition like that of a bodybuilder. Like, dude, I was jacked and I was lean and um, I felt really good about myself. And then I realized like, yeah, that's great. Like being 7% body fat walking around all the time as like the intention of my diet is not how you fuel this sport. Uh, and yet I was, again, very, um, you know, it's just like every other person in the world. I said, I'm the exception to the rule. My vanity comes first. And I just led myself down a path of destroying my HPA axis. And, and this is where I'm, I'm actually interested to get your take. Cause I've actually, I've had a conversation with Andy Galpin on this as well is I believe that's what begins what is never spoken about, but I believe is a phenomenon of um, central nervous system adaptation. So we know that like a lot of HPA axis dysfunction is excess time spent in your sympathetic nervous system and not enough parasympathetic inputs. Uh, but I believe that if you go to that state of, of dysfunction inside your HPA, or if you go to that adrenal fatigue state and you all the activities that you're performing while you're there, I think your body remembers that that is what drove you there and that when you try to do them later in life, uh, your body will not have a favorable response. Meaning what drove me to that place was CrossFit at a higher level. For me now to undertake CrossFit at a high level, even with perfect recovery and perfect nutrition, I don't think I could ever do it. I think my body remembers and it's going to fight back. 
Well, I'll tell you, the guy you want to talk to about that is named Jacques Taylor, and he's a good friend of mine. I'll connect you. And and uh, his thought is this. So him and I are working on something really, really, uh, I, I think, revolutionary, where you know every bodybuilder in the world and probably every CrossFitter uh, anchors their training to a negative emotion. Like, I'm going to go get pissed off. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to go kill this thing. Um, so every time thereby, you're wiring that into your brain, you're wiring that into your nervous system. So then every time I go back and pick up a weight, I'm anchored into that negative mindset. Um, imagine you could reverse that to where, you know, you, you anchor your training into a positive mindset, a joyed mindset, a, a, a mindset of accomplishment or achievement. Um, you're literally going to remember that memory every time then you go back into the gym. So you're literally anchoring a positive mindset. So exact same thing, man. If you're, so if your nervous system remembers you being in this uh, hyper stressed out state or this hyper anxious state while you were doing CrossFit, it's, 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 I don't say it's impossible, but it's extremely difficult to start breaking that habit and that ritual that you've indoctrinated into your brain. He's doing research on that stuff, man. He's a guy who's leading the way. And, you know, him and I talked about creating um, some unique programming and unique, um, you know, modalities around anchoring people into, you know, the, the mindset ultimately that they're trying to achieve in life. So, dude, I think, you know, I think that's huge. I mean, I think that a lot of people, and, you know, we've talked about this, we touched on it earlier. There's so many people that just, they completely miss that component of training and nutrition. Sure. Um, you know, they have to rather if, than they get to, you know, simple yeah. as that. And, and, and I mean, life is a gift in and of itself. And that's a whole other conversation. We could have another day and, and people that have the have to versus got to mindsets and everything. It's, you know, that's a whole other story. But inside of training and nutrition, I mean, you have the opportunity to create whatever you want in, in both modalities. And that's a pretty cool gift that we've been given as human beings. And not everybody gets that. So, you know, it's uh I think that's fascinating, man. I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. Yeah, so he's coming down to Florida for you know in in I think late August through kind of October, and we're just gonna put something together and really train my coaches in that idea. And I've been training my coaches in that idea for a while. And it, it, the easiest you know way to understand it is everyone has a strong body part, everyone has a weak body part, or everyone has a great lift that they're you know they're exceptional at and they do mindlessly, and they have the one that they stink at and. You know, you look at your mindset when you walk into that exercise that you're really, really good at. Usually, you know, in a great state of mind, you're happy, you're positive, you're, you know, you're often smiling, you're very confident. And that one you're not good at, you kind of dread and you drag your feet and you kind of don't want to do and, and it doesn't usually go as well. You don't progress it very well. You know, just the idea of skill acquisition in that. Like if you're in that negative mindset, your ability to acquire that skill is decreased. Your ability to perform that exercise is going to be decreased and diminished. And uh, that in itself is is a really positive framer for people to start thinking about is realize like it's already there. Like, you know, in that negative uh, framing that you're creating before anything you're doing, you, you, you're self-perpetuating your inability to execute and perform and improve. And if you could just start shifting that framing to saying, you know, Hey, I'm grateful I get to do this. I'm getting better every day. Um, you know, I'm working hard at something I'm not good at realizing my, my obstacle is my opportunity for progress. And if people can start shifting that framing, I think, you know, everybody can, can shift their life. And I don't think it takes as long as you think, because, you know, even for myself, man, when I retired from professional bodybuilding, Dude, I hated training. I didn't want to go to the gym, man, because it was always a had to rather than I get to. And then as soon as you remove yourself from that day to day attachment from the outcome, you can actually start to enjoy the process. And it literally took me two months to where I actually was loving training again. I'm like, God, I love going to the gym. I'm enjoying this like I did when I was a kid. And I think anyone can make that shift, man. So, you know, you say I couldn't do CrossFit again. I think you could if you were removed from the outcome. If you just went in and said, man, I'm just going to have a great workout today. I wonder. Uh, yeah. I and I guess it's not that I couldn't do CrossFit, but I wonder if my body would ever produce the same level of output that it once that it once did, right? And that's where I well, you don't need to though. Like, but right? do you need to? Yeah. Well, no. So I never will need to. You're right. And and I think that I there's been periods where I do still enjoy. I like you know I know that you guys have like the like the muscle building crowd on here, and and everybody will flame CrossFit, and I'll probably get flamed for saying it. But I I honestly enjoy the I enjoy like the the group component now listen i'm not going to sit here and, and say crossfit's great by any means because there's so many holes we can throw in the methodology and, and the way it's taught and and you and i are in full agreement with that but i will say there's been periods where you know listen man for me to to show up and just go through an hour and turn my mind off and, and be led through it was was great yeah um and i'm still able to do that and find enjoyment at times um, I think where my theory with like the, the nervous system adaptation comes in is I wonder, and, and you're right, I'll never need to, but I wonder if I ever would be able to 
ramp that back up. Not unless you had a goal, right? The only the only way I could become a professional bodybuilder again is if I had to go like the, the goal has to be pulling you just as hard as it once was. And now you no, have, no longer have that need in your life, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, man. Like it's the, the ability to create output really fascinates me. You need a purpose, right? Without a, without a clear driving purpose, you can't do it. Absolutely. So, you know, speaking about throwing CrossFit under the bus, man, uh, listen, b- bodybuilding is the exact same thing. You get monkeys in CrossFit, you get monkeys in bodybuilding. And when I see monkeys, it's, it's <laughs> monkey true. see, monkey do, right? I see somebody else Very doing true. it. I, I think CrossFit is, you know, a great, a great, great tool for people who are uh, well-trained people who are really good at exercising, uh, executing movements. If you're really good at these particular things, it's awesome. And conversely, it's absolutely reckless and, and terrible for people who are bad. And the same thing in bodybuilding, man, like if you're really good at something, get in there and work as hard as you can. But I think bodybuilding can be absolutely reckless for people who don't know what they're doing, which is why I take it upon myself to teach people who don't know what they're doing, how to master this stuff. Like it's not rocket science, man. And same thing in CrossFit. There's gotta be people out there teaching like, perfect form for CrossFit. Like stop screwing around. You're going to hurt yourself. This is why CrossFit's probably causing more injuries than it is good. Same in bodybuilding, man. Like everyone gets hurt in bodybuilding at some point. Once you finally get good at something is when you hurt yourself because <laughs> you're actually able to produce enough force, right? Yeah. You know, at the beginning, nobody hurts themselves because they're lifting, you know, baby weights, lifting the pink dumbbells. Yeah. But when they actually get strong enough that, you know, they're producing enough force, then that's when more serious injuries happen. And Dude, it's the same thing. It's, you know, just a different iteration of what it is. And obviously everyone's going to hate on each other. Like CrossFitters hate bodybuilders, bodybuilders hate CrossFitters. Well, just like people who do keto hate, hate vegans and vegans hate keto. Like it's, <laughs> the people just like to attach to what they're, what they're attached to, right? So true, dude. It's so true. Like the closed minded thing always blows my mind because I, as, as I age and as I live inside of this space, like I think that the one thing that I really hold true is to be not, uh, not accepting of application but at least accepting of ideas and to do my own research and and you know create my own conclusions and create my own applications um i think it's just so important that we do that and today's podcast is brought to you by atp labs we've just released a brand new product that you guys are going to love it's called mile prime uh, and this is just a creatine based product with some atp and hmb and the reason i love this product is it's kind of an add-on to your current pre-workout. So you guys know I'm not a big stimulant person, but I am a big focus person. And creatine really helps add to that focus product that I always take. So you guys know I'm a big fan of the GF, which is the growth factor by ATP, which is primarily just alpha-GPC and tyrosine, driving up some dopamine and acetylcholine in your brain. But if you want to add the pump factor and the cellular energy to that so that you can have the fuel you need to fuel your workouts, then I highly suggest you add Mile Prime. And if you think I'm cool, I think you're cool too. So if you use the code BEN10, B-E-N, and the number 1010, you get 10% off. Enjoy the podcast. Yeah, so let's pull this back around to talking about chronic overdieting because I know a lot of our um, our, our listeners and a lot just are people who like are unsure, like how much do I need to eat? And do I always need to be in a caloric excess or a caloric deficit? Or should I be cycling nutrition? And how do I, how do I set up an intelligently planned out nutrition program so that I can actually make progress in gaining lean muscle, feeling great and, and being lean ultimately, right? That's what everyone wants. Everyone wants to, to love their body. They want to feel great. They want to be lean. They want to be strong and resilient. Um, where does it start, man? You know, assuming people have a body composition goal, in your opinion, um, you know, where, where does it start? Should it be a day-to-day cyclical thing based around your your training? Should it be a weekly cyclical thing based on you know your your current objective? Um, should, you know, well, where's, where's it, the jumping off point? I think it's I think it starts even before that, man. I think it starts with what you and I talked about earlier, which is a self assessment. Yeah. You know, I think that as as you just said, right, it's a weekly thing or a day-to-day cyclical thing around training. Well, there's two completely different people. If you told me that I had to do a day-to-day thing cyclically around my training, dude, I don't even know sometimes when I wake up in the morning, if I'm going to get to train that day, it's just, it's just the nature of, (laughs) yeah, it's just the nature of business development. It's the nature of having a family. It's, you know, it's me. The truth is it's me not making it a priority. Like I'll I'll admit that. Yeah. Um, but it's also, that's where I've chosen it to sit in my life currently. So if, if you told me that I had to do that, it, I'm pretty sure that I would apply, I would misapply that um, because I would wake up some days intending to train that would throw off, you know, any sort of nutrient timing I had planned along with macronutrient consumption for the day. So the, the first thing is like, who are you? What have you done? 
where are you currently at? So we could take two completely different people that want to build muscle. And, you know, we could take a guy that's, you know, average college kid, five, nine, 200 pounds, uh, just put on his freshman 15, you know, a little chubby. Uh, if he's coming to me and he wants to put on muscle, I'm probably going to advise that we strip down a little bit of body fat yeah. first, uh, make him a little bit more efficient so that what we're putting on is quality tissue. Cause you know, like I know, I mean, you're not, you're never, unless you're using a ton of anabolics and even at that point, only going to put on muscle, like there's always going to be some body fat that comes with it. So if you're already starting with a base of, of body fat that is too high, you need to bring that down. Um, you know, or you could have me that was like the, the skinny anorexic kid that was a buck 18 and it's like, man, all right, well, seven days in a surplus for sure. So it's, uh, as much as I would love to be like, man, like there's one protocol that is amazing for everyone. There's not now, I think we could talk about what's optimal. Um, and I think that optimal, you know, I, I am a fan of, of using, uh, like a cyclical base around training and non-training days. Cause I think it's, it's a great way to get precise. I am a fan of timing your nutrients appropriately. Uh, I think, you know, obviously more and more research continues to come out on adequate protein intake. Um, and you know, it, it's even that we talked about the cyclical nature of nutrition for so long, high protein was, was touted as the best thing in the world. And I, I think over like the last five, six years, we've seen lower and lower protein recommendations. Now, all of a sudden you're starting to see the pendulum swing the other way where people are promoting more protein again. Um, and, and, you know, research can be conducted to prove anything. And so right. it's, uh, yeah, it's it's always very difficult to decipher what is great. But, you know, I'll tell you this, even even if tomorrow it came out definitively and it said two two grams per uh, two grams of protein per pound of body weight to gain muscle, I would just have to accept the fact that I'm never going to be optimal because my gut is never going to digest that much protein. I've experimented with higher protein intakes. Um, it just hasn't worked for me. And and so I know what where I function optimally. I know where I feel my best. And. For me, feeling my best also drives me to wanting to train. It drives me to training at my peak. Uh, and so there's so many different factors that I think have to be taken in that just are not spoken about. And it's it's the same in fat loss. You know, you, you kind of started this whole phase of the conversation asking about chronic overdieting. Everyone's like, well, you got to be in a calorie deficit. And, you know, you get Susan that comes to you that's eating 1,500 calories. She's like, well, I need to be in a bigger deficit, so I'm going to drop to 1,200. Oh, I'm going to drop to 900. And I say this, and so many people are probably like, yeah, yeah, like blah, blah, because that's becoming common. Well, it's common in our circle. It's not common in the world. Yet. Right. Like if you were to go down the street and you ask every female if 2,000 calories is appropriate, they're going to look at you and be like, yeah, right, if I want to get fat. And and yet 2,000 calories, 1,800 calories, not overly – uh, it's not overly high for a lot of women. My, my wife's so, 12 pounds. And when I started her diet, she was doing yeah. 2,300 calories a day and getting leaner. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's, um, and, and we, we get that because it's the space that we live in, but a lot of people, uh, outside the industry, they don't comprehend that. And it's our job to inform them and to level with them. And, and again, going back to the whole coaching aspect, just creating that trust with them uh, I always use the words education drives compliance inside of coaching. And I think when you actually properly educate your clients and you help them understand why we're doing what we're doing, uh, that will usually foster. Compliance. So man, one of the things that I want to get clear on is, is what biomarkers are you actually looking at to assess where someone is in their, in their, you know, like someone comes to you, you get, you know, let's say you get a 10 new clients at a time or you get a hundred new clients. How many clients are you getting? Yep. What, what are you looking at, man? Like, you know, are you looking at subjective, um, in, you know, are you looking at blood? Are you looking at sub subjective markers like inflammation and stress and, and uh, you know, sleep? And what, what are you looking at to actually get a good jumping off point for these people? So it's going to vary. It's going to vary. Um, and I'll give you like some really good examples. Like the average person that comes to me, I'm typically looking, you know, physical markers, age, height, weight, like standard stuff, pictures, measurements. Um, any data that they have there. And then we also do all of the subjective measurements too. We call it biofeedback. Yeah. Um, the first person I ever heard use the term was Scott Abel. So I always credit him, but um, you know, he was the first person ever that I heard talk about like hunger cues, sleep, um, you know, mental acuity, uh, ability to focus, energy. 
And so uh, inside of like our tracking documents, we have about eight or nine subjective scores where we ask people to rank them every single day uh, on a scale of one to five. And so when we're checking with our clients, we're seeing every 10 to 12 days, uh, you know, what, how are those things changing? And if all of a sudden there was like a three day lull in sleep, uh, that's obviously a point of discussion. Like, why did your sleep get really crappy for three days? Oh, well, you know, I actually ate, you know, pizza inside of my, my macros for those three days instead of higher quality, more micronutrient dense foods. Uh, and it's like, great. Well, now you have a, a very, you know, a very p uh, direct piece of information that shows you that low quality foods or potentially gluten or even potentially dairy or something else is actually causing an inability to sleep. We know inability to sleep over a long period of time is going to, uh, you know, not be optimal for recovery. And so we know the rabbit hole we're going down. So it's just a really good piece of information. But uh, you know, that's, that's very surface level. That's probably 90% of people that are coming to us because there's just no, no more that's needed. Now we work with a good amount of people that are coming to us broken. Uh, and again, the CrossFit industry has broken a lot of people, not just because of CrossFit, but because CrossFit was paired up with like the paleo diet and zone diet, neither of which provided adequate amounts of fuel or recovery. Uh, and as we talked about earlier, when you live in this chronically under recovered, underfed state, you just go down the rabbit hole of HP axis dysfunction. And so we're working with a lot of those people. So sometimes we are doing uh, like Dutch tests, right? We're doing salivary cortisol tests. Uh, you know, we're doing food intolerance tests, GI map tests. Um, you know, I just worked with Charlotte Flair when she was uh, in ESPN, the body issue. And, you know, she came to me and she showed me all the things she had been trying. And it's like, you know, something doesn't add up. Like it's not just the caloric intake. It's not just the food choices. Like, uh, in certain diets, like there's something deeper. And so we actually did a food sensitivity test and we found that the majority of foods that she enjoyed that she was consuming were just leaving her bloated. Um, you know, and using that food intolerance test, we switched everything over to what agreed with her uh, the most. And dude, she leaned out. I mean, she had abs in like three weeks and she hadn't seen abs in years. So it, you know, it, it's always going to depend on the individual. Like what are the needs? How deep do they want to go? Um, I'm fascinated. The more data that you can let me get from you, I will take it. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, man. Do you think um, a caloric deficit is going to have the same degree of negative impact on someone who has an excess of adipose tissue or excess of, of, of body weight? How much of a calorie deficit are we talking? I don't know. So, you know, just, just going down. So, so let's, yeah. so I always like to defer, I always like to define calorie deficits as, um, and again, I actually borrowed this from Scott. Um, I don't know. Call it, call it 20%. So 20% is, a, it's a reasonable deficit, right? I don't think that's excessive. Um, you know, if, if they have a lot of weight to lose, I don't think that's going to hurt them nearly as bad as somebody that doesn't have as much to lose. So we talk about like this, this chronically over dieted yeah. state, right? So someone who's always in a, in a caloric deficit, will that impact somebody who's, uh, you know, in healthy body weight range differently than someone who's in a, in a, you know, overfed store or, or a obese state? Well, over, you know, yeah, assuming all things normal, assuming all things normal. And I'm going to start it with that caveat because of course, if, if you're, <laughs> If we're talking about an obese person, we're all logically concluding that they, you know, they reached obesity on the premise of consuming entirely too much food. Yeah, um, of course. And under activity. So the answer is no, because that's actually what this person needs. And the truth is a 20% deficit for them is actually only going to enhance uh, longevity. It's only going to enhance, you know, biomarkers of health. Right. Uh, you take somebody that's very lean. Remember, being really lean in and of itself is already a navigation away from set point, right? So that is, you've already moved away from set point. Your body's already throwing up compensatory mechanisms to try to get you back to set point. There's always, there's some metabolic uh, compensations being made. And so then you're tacking on a calorie deficit um, on top of that. And, and so absolutely, man, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be 10x worse. Now, going back to the caveat I gave, uh, assuming all things normal with the obese person, some people end up uh, reaching an overweight state with a lot of like yo-yo dieting where they are chronically living in this thousand calorie state. And yet every 10 to 12 days they binge and, and dude, their binges like you and I have never seen, um, speak for yourself, and, man. And so that person, <laughs> <laughs> dude, I, uh, I may not have, I don't know, man, I can't ever throw down. Like it, it goes back to the anorexic nature. I don't like feeling extremely stuffed. 
Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I've, they, been, uh, I've been known to know, have some cheat days, especially actually back when I worked with Scott <laughs> Abel, man. You know, I, work, I told you I used to work with Scott Abel when I was like 19 or something. Oh. And he would just advocate oh. the most uh, – just, just, the cycle diet, uh, right? No, it was even before he invented the cycle diet. Um, it was it was just disgusting cheat days, man. I have stories, but we won't go there. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did the cycle diet with him for the better part of a year, and I fair play. I was shredded, dude. I walked around with with shredded glutes like just every day, um, and and I had cheat days like. It probably pale in comparison to yours, but I mean, like the start of my cheat day was I would go to Dunkin' Donuts, get a dozen donuts, go to IHOP, and get like an omelet, and pancakes, and then wash it <laughs> all down with right. a frat. And that was one day a week, and the rest of the week you just you, you were you were uh, calories. you were clean. Yeah, like all and and protein, carbohydrate, like zero fat, like yeah, you know, egg whites, chicken breast, tuna, like no added fats anywhere. Um, right. And your, your, your body, like your, your blood lipids were probably through the roof. Your blood sugar yeah, was probably dude. destroyed. And uh, dude, yeah, it, anyways, we won't get into health markets because health doesn't matter if you look good, right? Exactly. What does health matter if you look great, man? Come exactly, on, you just try the glute. That's all that matters. Right. Yeah. yeah. That nobody uh, ever right. saw because they were covered up, eh? you know, like I was never getting on stage. It's just a fitness model thing, but no, it's right. Uh, but you know, Monday through Wednesday, your stomach was probably so distended and bloated. You felt like shit, but your glutes were shredded. <laughs> exactly. You know, when you reco- well, when exactly. you're recovering from those, those cheat days, man, you just feel so crappy because oh, your digestion is worse. The next day was the worst. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Trying to sleep that night. Like, uh, my head hurts when I lay down. <laughs> if I can only sleep standing up. <laughs> I remember it was, it was meant to be the cheat days were meant to be on your, your non-training day. Right. And I would feel so shitty the day after cheat days that I started, I would train like 5 a.m. on Saturday and then do the cheat day the rest of the day right. and then take Sunday off of training because I knew I would feel so bad the day after the cheat day. Dude, I didn't uh, want to talk about this because people are going to think we're advocating this and I just think it's the stupidest, <laughs> I think it's the stupidest it is, thing It's not, it is not how you want to approach a diet. Like, dude, uh, well, here, we'll tie it into everything we just talked about because one of the things we talked about on this podcast is the mental approach to dieting, understanding who you are, understanding, you know, creating like a, and, and to be fair, like anybody with any amount of food issues should not undertake a diet like that. Uh, because all, and, and I don't know how it was for you, but it turned into me six days out of the week, just trying to survive and trying to get through so that I could get to that seventh day. Yeah. And just like, gorge and in the the emphasis from my training was lost there was no progressive overload in my training there was i didn't even care as long as i went in and got it done it just it didn't even matter um and like yeah there's nothing positive that comes with that i don't i definitely don't want to come across like we promote that i honestly think speaking transparently i think it still impacts me now man you've i've created such a negative or, or had created such a negative association in my mind unconsciously with food that you know, food becomes a reward yeah. mechanism. When you start something, like you just you just have to eat yeah. it all. Like if you know, you can't just have one donut or you can't just have one piece of cake. You got to have all yeah. of them, right? You got to eat till you're disgustingly full. And I, honestly, I still, I mean, I don't think I'd fight with it now, but I think I'm still aware of it now. Where when you know you start eating something, you just want to eat it all. And you know, this this Gretchen Rubin psychologist lady, the person I brought up earlier, speaks about um, you know there's different types of uh, motivations, like different types of motivation styles. And she believes that some people are like these completion people, like either all or nothing kind of people I, mean, I don't know if i'm that person but uh, i really think that at least during my bodybuilding career it impacted my ability to um you know just kind of ration myself like hey man could you could you just have you know one bite of the cake or do you have to eat the whole cake um i think now i'm fine but during my career i think i definitely fought with that man and i think a lot of people have that issue when you start creating that that belief around like oh i'm gonna have to eat all of this food on sunday because i want to get it all out of my house no man like fuck it's okay to have a cookie in your house that you don't have to yeah. eat you know that that's part yeah. of being a human being exactly. so i think there's, there's huge issues with that man well dude it got it got popular again yeah and that's the thing i think people want to people want to portray having a cheat meal in your diet as balance and and i'm not going to tell them they're wrong but i'm also not going right. to 100 validate them and tell them they're right because i've witnessed the psychological effects that go with having a cheat meal in your diet well, and a cheat meal is not, one thing, but a cheat always. like gorge is different, right? Oh, dude, but you know, like I know, you've seen the fucking bikini girls that will, <laughs> yeah. uh, like, I they'll wait for Saturday night and they'll be like, Saturday night cheat meal, guys. Like, let's eat like 10 pounds of queso, <laughs> three burgers, and, and as much dessert and alcohol as we can fit in our mouth. And it's like, I mean, I I used to date a figure pro that, dude, 
I woke up in the middle of the night one night to her pacing around the room because she had stuffed herself too much. And I'm like, that's that's the mindset that it's perpetuating. Here's the thing that people don't see about that. They stink. Like the toxins oh, coming out so of it. Did you dude. Hear, right? <laughs> <laughs> Man, oh yeah. Maybe they don't realize it themselves, but they just like the, the toxins coming out of their skin. You're just like, oh my God, I don't want to be within like, 10 so yards bad. of you. Yeah. Yep. Funny. Yep. Uh, but yeah, so, so all you fitness but, girls out but there. So, are but listening. going back to the whole thing with, yeah, it's a complete sidetrack, but, um, uh, but going back to like the whole thing, like on, you know, the obese person putting them in a 20% calorie deficit, if there's been some metabolic adaptations that have taken place, it's not a, it's not a negative thing, but it's not going to be as advantageous, um, as if they had reached obesity via what I think everybody is thinking. That, that they reached obesity with. So speaking of our wonderful daughters, Jason, someone's just joined me. You want to say hi? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Yes. Hi. And this is my friend, Jason. You want to say hi? No. 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 <laughs> no. If, if my daughter was here, you'd just hear her screaming. Say hi, Mr. Jason. No. Why? Because. <laughs> okay. He said hi to you. Mm. This is Presley. My That's angel. awesome. Hi, Presley. Okay, you don't have to talk. We're talking about nutrition. Do you want to talk about nutrition too? Mm-hmm. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Uh, did you have steak? I had nothing. What? Are you fasting? <laughs> no, <Just> fasting. <laughs> <laughs> what did you have for breakfast? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. What did you have for lunch? Lunch, grilled cheese. Grilled cheese? That's not normal for you. <laughs> How was it? A grilled cheese. You did. Well, that's what happens when a mommy cooks for you, isn't it? And <laughs> avocado. Oh, grilled cheese and avocado. That sounds pretty good. Oh, there you go. Get those good there fats go. in there. And normally, you have, normally she wakes up and she's saying, "What do you want for breakfast? I want steak and kale." Right. Nice. That's what my daughter. Yeah, you, you got to come train the kids at my house. Is that what they eat? Uh, they don't eat steak and kale, <laughs> that's for eat? sure. <laughs> they get up and they're like, well, so mind you, I have, well, you know my situation. I have yeah. three step kids. Um, and they, uh, their eating habits are slowly being reformed. Although I, I'll tell you this, this is a topic for a completely different day. Uh, they, I won't say they have behavior issues, but I, all, I will also level and say their behavior is not yeah. optimal. And it, I believe a lot of it has to do with uh, microbiome. And whenever I'm able to prolong sugar being out of the house, we see behavioral improvements. A thousand percent. Uh, and so it's, yep. Yep. And so it's something that like, it, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a battle in my house uh, because I'm, I am obviously advocating, listen, we need to remove as much sugar as we possibly can. And I, I try to respect the fact that they're children Dude, that, that's not an excuse, though, right? I, I, I'm against that excuse. Like people I are agree. like, "Oh, but the I kids agree. are supposed." To. I'm like, "No, no, no, no. That that's the opposite, man. You're, you're destroying their lives." Nobody, nobody was supposed to. <laughs> like that's not that's not how we were born into this world. But uh, you know, I, I I try to have respect for how they were brought up, and obviously, again, they're not they're not my children and their stepdad, and and so, but it is rubbing off, and it is slowly working. Uh, but that's yeah, I. That's something I'm big on, man. Is is controlling the microbiome, especially in our, our youth, and creating behavior. Yeah, and, and honestly, I, I don't claim to know what foods are good and what foods are bad. You know, like how can how can you just typecast and say, well, that food is a bad food? We know sugar is bad. We know anything fried is going to be bad, like trans fats. But I try to give them variety, man. I try to give them choices, and and I don't make you know, no food is is like a, you must eat this food kind of thing, you know. Uh, but at the same time, it's also going to be always based around whole foods and trying to minimize the amount of sugar they consume. And I try to give them balance, you know. So if we're eating a meal, you're going to have carbs, you're going to have fats, you're going to have you're going to have proteins, and you're going to eat all of them, you know. At the end of the day, um, but you know that's kind of how balance works around my house. And then they just choose what what's their favorite. And you know, my daughter just happens to be the one who, since she was six months old, has been sitting on my lap and eating steak and you know my bodybuilding diet, my my beef and my avocado and my olive oil and my sea salt and. That's kind of what she eats every day, man, and, and she—that's what she's grown a taste for. Now, my son, on the other hand, is a whole different ball game, but we won't, we won't get into that. Um, but, anyways, man, coming pulling this back full circle, how can we help people ultimately start to understand what needs to happen to to create a successful nutrition plan for themselves? So, um, when it comes to 
choosing, you know, uh, macronutrient ratios? What are your your basic guidelines? So actually, the first thing I should ask, even before macronutrients, how are you determining a jumping off point for calories? It's going with BMR uh, ratios? Or? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, the, the, I think that like the best way, you know, the, the best way from a scientific perspective is to go, you know, use like a daily energy expenditure, right? So figure out what BMR is, use an intensity multiplier, figure out perceived daily energy expenditure, um, you know, for, for the person, and then obviously create a surplus or a deficit accordingly. Um, I think that's the best way to go. Now, I'll, I'll say that a bit tongue in cheek and, and see, you know, obviously if you can get a prolonged food recall from a client, see like what average intake is over a period of time and how that is, how that has been affecting them. That's obviously really great data as well. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's usually where we like to start relative to calories from there. Uh, you know, the macros are going to be divided on, on several different things. Obviously, there's a lot of research and, and there's a pretty definitive study that says, you know, assuming uh, that caloric intake was set up properly and protein intake was set up properly, uh, your ratio of carbs to fats really does not matter uh, in terms of actually creating fat loss. It seems that way, right? Right. And, and that's what, I mean, that's what research says. And so I'm going to look at a lot of things. You know, I, I think Paul Quinn, you know, he, he coined the phrase, earn your carbohydrates. Um if you've got a, a pretty high output throughout the day, uh, I'm not going to tell you that you should be living on relatively low carbohydrates and they have to be timed around your training. You know, a construction worker, for instance, probably not going to be ideal for them. Um, that being said, you know, myself, I do fantastic on carbohydrates timed around my training because, you know, my job is, is coach and it's uh, to lead my business. And so, you know, sitting, uh, sitting at a desk and at a computer and being on the phone really doesn't require a ton of carbohydrate in my diet. So I, I have better cognitive function with, uh, you know, higher protein and fat intake, less carbohydrate in it being structured around my training. So, you know, you're, we're looking at things. What are the modality of your training? Uh, what is the energy systems involved inside of your training? Um, and and then, we kinda, then we kinda break it down from there. But it's always gonna be done calories first then we set protein intake to be adequate uh, and then we figure out based on your activity level the modality of your training and also your dietary history because uh, you know success leaves clues uh, what your you know what your carbohydrate to fat ratio should be and that's where we start and as far as progression um, incremental progressions whether it be up or down do you have a certain um, you know method you use or a certain ratio you use or percentage that allows people to make uh, I would love, I would love to say I did like, but I think I'd be lying to you if I said I did. Um, you know, uh, for me, the, and, and it's not to say that it doesn't exist, but my mind, and this is actually where my challenge into getting into the space was for so long. My mind is very myopic. Like when I work with an individual, I work with the individual and I try not to think about what I should be doing. I try to really look at the situation presented to me in front of me and say what needs to be done in this situation to optimize this situation and and that's really how i approach it and that's why our assessments are as frequent as they are uh, and, and that's why the communication is as open as it is because i don't necessarily have a i have a plan of where i want to be but i don't think that you can have exact steps i just think that you actually end up right. setting yourself up and i love disaster. that so you're teaching your coaches skills and you're teaching them at adaptable you know interventions and uh, that really brings me to the conversation mm -hmm. around um you know what type of interventions are you starting to uh, introduce into people's lives as far as are, and are you even dealing with that are you guys exclusively dealing with nutrition as far as you know you know mitigating inflammation or you know managing stress are you starting to address those things at all in, in your coaching platform oh dude so i don't know if you're familiar with christian placencia he's uh he's the durability guy on it and him and i have really become friends over the last year and he introduced to me, um, you know, a lot of parasympathetic activities that I share with my clients. And then also, I know, you know, Ryan yep. Blatt, um, like the, you know, the brain health expert, and he introduced to me like a sympathetic and parasympathetic input chart. And so I have my clients do a lot of that really, uh, just so that they can visually see how many more sympathetic inputs they have than parasympathetic inputs, because I don't think it's, I don't think a lot of people comprehend it. I think a lot of people just create this assumption that, oh, like I'm not as stressed out as most people and, and the amount of stress in my life is not insurmountable and it's not, it's not affecting my results in the gym or 
for my body confidence. So I use things like that. But man, uh, you know, we call ourselves nutrition coaches, but I really place an emphasis on the word coach because that is where I feel like we do our best work. We help them understand what's happening in their lives. And, and I'm not afraid to not have a nutrition discussion for 30 days if it means that we're improving something that will ultimately lead to more success inside of nutrition. Um, so dude, we'll do, we'll do everything, man. Like there's the only thing I don't directly consult on is write a training program because I just, I left that space a long time ago. I leave it to experts like you. Um, and it's not something that I really, that just ever made me want to dive deep into like the knowledge behind it. Uh, and, and so I, I really geek out on the nutritional side, but, I will I will advise wherever I feel like I need to advise to create success with the individual because at the end of the day that's that's what we're after. Is and success. you've been doing it for a long time. What I'm curious about is how you're able to um, create kind of standardized templates for your coaches. Like you know, I know you're doing you're training thousands of coaches at well, a time, right? I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll tell you. We don't though. Like, and, and maybe that's why. Like, we don't actually create any sort of templates for the coaches. I think what we do instead is we teach them. How to create problems. So you know, our process is really helping helping our coaches understand assessment and subsequent application. And and I think that's why why we've been able to have the magic that we do is our coaches are are just you know they're me six years ago. You know when when I was doing tons and tons of coaching. Uh, and, and I think that's the beauty of it, man. We're teaching people to critically think. We're teaching people to assess and, and to really understand what is presented in front of them. Well, I think that, you know, speaking to a guy who teaches a lot of coaches, you need to have a really good understanding of, um, you need to have a really good understanding in order to teach them the thought process, right? Because it's obviously teacher, it's much harder, it's much harder to teach somebody oh, a thought yes. process than it is <laughs> to teach them a uh, cookie cutter, uh, you know, here's this, you know, intake form and here's this uh, intervention, you know, like the, you know, I always kind of throw these guys under the bus, but the physical therapists, I think physical therapy is a great modality, but it's just, it's like, here, read this book. If you see these, um, you know, possible um, manifestations, well, here's the treatment, right? So like if someone has a sore ankle, well, you need to do this. You know, if they can't do the access to the range of motion, here's the protocol, here's the treatment. And then there's no thought process. It's like, you know, read this book, apply this, this um, application. And I get why that has to be the case because, you know, it's all insured and everything needs to be standardized to ensure the insurance companies are going to be are paying it. Um, but when it comes to nutrition, unfortunately, you can't do that stuff. And when it comes to life, unfortunately, <laughs> stuff doesn't usually work. Um, so, yeah, I love the fact that you're able to, um, you know, start teaching a thought process because that's what I'm teaching when it comes to coaches, right? When it comes to trainers. It's like, yeah. That's, and that's really what it is, man. You're teaching that process. And that's, because the process is where the magic is. Like, like the, end, the end prescription is just a result of the process. And even when we work with our clients, we want our clients invested in the process. So, uh the magic in everything. Do you have any things that are process. kind of your low-hanging fruit that you go to first in people? Like if you're seeing somebody not getting results and, you know, they're saying, hey, man, you know, I'm never, I think I'm doing everything right. I'm following exactly what you say. Um, do you have any things that are, you know, your your biggest levers that you pull with people? A lot. I mean, almost everything is going to be that that sympathetic, parasympathetic, right? Understanding the role yeah. of stress. <laughs> Dude, um, you and I are having the same conversation with our client. Man. <laughs> I love this. It's, it's literally it's, like, hey, man, yeah. Because that, that's affecting sleep, that's affecting digestion, exactly. that's affecting mindset, exactly. that's all those things, right? Yeah. If we can control stress, I mean, that's the – and it's it's within your control. It's, uh, you know, it's not something that's outside of your control. And and so, you know, from there, obviously, all the things that stress modulates, um, you know, then, then you can kind of go down those rabbit holes, gut health. Quality, okay, so sleep. tell me about these these parasympathetic interventions that uh, this gentleman told you about. I, I don't remember his name. Sorry. Oh, Ryan Glad. Um, oh, oh, so also oh, like with Christian. Well, one of the big things that Christian has done is just incorporating like flow work, uh, movement work. So I have a belief that every sympathetic input should have a, a parasympathetic input, right? So if you're if you're going and you're performing a training session, you should have a dedicated recovery modality. So whether it's breathing work, post workout. Uh, along with you know some carbohydrates, if it is uh, you know a, a flush session later in the day where it's just you know thirty minutes of walking to kind of uh, you know, to flush everything out, I, I think that for every sympathetic input you're creating, you should be able to that you're actively creating. Uh, obviously, you know the, the life stress. You're not should it be an equal amount of time? 
No, I don't think that the time has to be equal. Um, like, I don't think you're going to be able. I, I think at that point, if you're training sixty to ninety minutes, uh, I don't think that you can pull another sixty to ninety minutes purely to to recover. Um, I, at least not in my experience, man. Like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't require that of somebody. Do I think it would get great results? Absolutely. If you could do ninety minutes of intense training, and uh, you know, then do like ninety minutes of you know some like some yoga. Um, or, you know, some sort of, like, very parasympathetic type movement, that would be fantastic. I mean, even jumping in a sauna, right, or a sauna combined with a cold shower. Yeah, and... yeah. contrast therapy, post-workout, yeah, anything. And there's so many parasympathetic inputs, but the problem is everybody wants to understate the sympathetic, and they want to overstate the parasympathetic. So they're like, oh, well, I train, while well, I'm used to training all the time, so that, you know, that must not be that much of an input. Oh, and I get a massage like once every two weeks. So that must be a really good parasympathetic input. It's like, if we were assigning numerical values from one to 10, you know, you're training on a day-to-day basis. I don't know what your intensity is, but you know, when you were at your peak, it's probably eight or nine. And you know, a massage every two weeks is probably like a two or a three. And so you're still getting way more sympathetic input than parasympathetic, and you're still leading down that rabbit hole of excessive stress. Yeah, absolutely, man. Now, now, since having left bodybuilding, so the, the the curse of of being in the sport is, you know, as we spoke about this daily attachment to the outcome, and I, you know, every day had to be a world class workout. Otherwise, I was angry with myself. You know, if I wasn't like leaving the gym like I had my head yeah. smashed against the wall, I didn't feel like I had accomplished anything. And and since having been able to leave bodybuilding and and um, you know be able to step back and just kind of look and, and observe and and watch other clients and other other people that I'm training. I realized the importance of, of the parasympathetic and how much more you could actually get out of the training session had you actually, you know, to use the brakes a little bit more, right? Rather than always living on the gas pedal, use the brakes a little bit more, just allowing you to, you know, actually get more out of your workouts. I train so much less now and I feel so much better. And I'm, you know, my strength probably honestly hasn't dropped at all. Yep. You know, obviously, my, my hypertrophy has have dropped a lot because I'm, I'm not eating a fraction of what I was before, but. Uh, dude, my strength is just as good as it was when I was competing. And that's, a, you know, a, a result of my taking care of my nervous system, my parasympathetic nervous system. So, so interesting to, yep. to acknowledge all these things. Yeah. It's, it's huge, dude. Yeah. It, and well, and you know, I mean, you're, when you're an athlete or you're type A and you're like in the moment, like you, you think that you're, you know, we have this mindset of we're going to outwork everything and we're you know we're just going to work and create the results instead of do what is necessary for the results to happen well you also have the stress of, of you also have the stress of, of like hey i have yeah. to perform like i was getting paid and like shit i don't want someone to take away my contract someone's going to take someone's going to beat me like no 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 i have to go out and i'm going to work harder than them and that, that's the, that's a you know a paradigm in this industry that i try to get people away from is you know hard work is is not the answer man like you know, so the way I teach exercise, man, is internal versus external focus, right? So, um, you know, if you have an external focus, you're attached to, you know, how much you lift, uh, how many reps you did, how, how much weight you did, uh, all, all these, you know, what exercise it is, that's an external focus. And, you know, that that paradigm is created in youth in, in sports, meaning like the more goals you score, the faster you run, the higher you jump, the better you do. So that's an external focus that people attach to in exercise. With bodybuilding and muscle building, it has to be, become an internal focus. It has to become something around like, hey, what is my, what's happening on the inside of my body? So I'm, us, I'm using this external um, mechanism to create an internal response. So I want the muscles to grow or I want, the, the, I want my you know, body to burn fat or whatever it is. Uh, as soon as I was able to to shift that focus from the external focus to an internal focus, I kind of lost attachment to how how it needed to happen. I didn't necessarily ha- it didn't need to be a specific exercise or a specific number of sets and reps and set, uh, and volume. It's just like no, no, no. I just need to create the greatest amount of intramuscular tension and uh, intramuscular stimulus as possible. And then all of a sudden, I started doing that. My body started changing really fast with way less work so it's the idea of working much harder or sorry much smarter before you ever work hard right you know working smart and directing the the work where you want it to go rather than just arbitrarily working hard which you know is the curse because the objective in in training whether you know if your objective is creating a great body composition your objective should be creating the the largest amount of muscular stress with the smallest amount of systemic stress so i don't want my my whole body to be you know 
stressed and inflamed from this workout. Like I, I want to have a laser focused. I want to have a precise stimulus to like I'm training my biceps. Well, if I'm training my biceps, I want to create the greatest amount of bicep stimulus with the smallest amount of systemic stress and, and stimulus to the rest of my body. And most people to do that, you know, they're going to have to, to, to get their biceps to grow. They're doing so much work that uh, because the form sucks and the muscle is not actually doing a lot of work, they're creating so much work that their sympathetic stress from that workout is going to override the muscular yep. building. Exactly, dude. And, it, and it's that it's that chronic stress with the inability. You know, at the at the fundamental at the core of everything that we do, right? It's you're intentionally creating stress with the the desire to facilitate adaptation, right? You want to create an adaptation to that stress. Yeah, exactly. You know? So, you know, hypertrophy, you're breaking up muscles, trying to like regrow it a little bit bigger. And strength, you're you know, you're imposing a load and you want to progressively overload and you know, even in fat loss, like you're imposing a calorie deficit which is stressor and the adaptation would be fat loss. And so when you lose the ability to create adaptation to that stressor, you're done. Uh, results will no longer happen. And, and really that's where you start pushing towards all these negative things that we've referenced uh, inside of the HPA axis dysfunction. Yeah, and, and that's a beautiful thing to get people to understand is it's minimum effective dose to force adaptation, right? Because ultimately, exactly. we're always going to have to incrementally move the needle just a little bit further, just a little bit further. But the objective is not how much can I possibly get away with, it's how little can I possibly do to have to actually get this novel stimulus and this novel adaptation response. Exactly. Yep. Beautiful, man. Absolutely love it. What are your, uh, just like one more question I want to dive into, um, post-workout yeah. recovery strategies. Um, so we get a lot of people who are, you know, let's say someone is, you know, living this life of this chronic sympathetic stress. Um, how are you um, beginning to, you know, you talked about this breathing, uh, you know, this, I thought I was the only person saying that. It's funny that you say that. Like I make all of my clients do five minutes of meditative breathing after every workout. Yeah. So I'm like, man, you, you got to take yourself out of sympathetic and get yourself into parasympathetic as quickly as possible. What other strategies? And you, you mentioned carbohydrates. Um, tell me about you know what happens after a workout and how I'm getting my body as quickly as I can out of sympathetic into parasympathetic. So what's happening is like you know when you're when you're inside a training. I mean, you know, like I know you're in that sympathetic nervous system state, and that's defined by an elevation in cortisol. Uh, and, you know, ultimately post-workout, your body doesn't know just because you left the gym that the workout is over, right? It, it's like, it's not like, you know, in a CrossFitter, your it's body's not like thinking you're in a war, right? Your, the, body, your body's in panic. Yeah, right? it's still fight or flight, dude. It's still running from the bear. And so, you know, by you taking that time to do that breathing, you've now calmed it and you've let it know that the war is over, or the bear is no longer chasing you. Um, you know, we, we also have seen some studies that show high molecular weight carbs, uh, can help, you know, blunt the cortisol response. Um, so, you know, in like, like with CrossFitters, before they do their breathing work, I'm having them take like a cyclic dextrin product. Um, and, you know, really any post-workout recovery, but the goal is to create that cortisol shutoff because cortisol is powerful. Remember, you know, we talked earlier, when you can't produce cortisol, that's the real death. Um, cortisol is definitely powerful inside of training. You need it to really produce optimal uh, performance, but you can't prolong the exposure to your body of having elevated cortisol, or that's when, you know, again, you start running on chronic cortisol or long-term you have no cortisol. Very interesting, man. And listen, I'm so grateful for you having that conversation because, you know, ultimately we need to change the paradigm of the fitness industry and we need to be leading from the front because, the reality is we're probably 30 years behind where, where we should be because people should know this stuff. It's so it's such basic information, but nobody thinks about it. And more importantly, nobody realizes how valuable it is in their progress. Most people think, hey, man, I just need to work harder. And I'm like, yep. God, that's the dumbest thing you could possibly do. Like, stop working harder. Work smarter. Get your body recovering faster. Make the most of this acute stimulus and then get your body into recovery mode. Because, you know, so many people are fighting this reality of, hey, man, you know, I, I can't build muscle. Hey, man, I can't lose fat. And that's absolute BS. The only reason you're not making progress is because your nervous system is jacked up and you got to start spending more time in parasympathetic so your body can actually get into this, this phase of having healthy hormones or decreased inflammation or you know, decreased cortisol or, or at least appropriate cortisol rhythms. Um, God, God, I love that you're teaching this stuff, man. So do keep doing what you're doing. I'm so grateful for it. Um, where can people find your nutrition certification? So you're training trainers. Yeah, dude. Yeah. So we're, we're coaching coaches on, on how to do this. Um, that is inside of the nutritional coaching Institute. So NCI certifications.com, uh, is the website. 
and that will um, you know that'll get them all the information on the upcoming courses. You know, we have like a level one course, we have a hormone specialty course, we have a mindset specialty course. Obviously, you know, as people just listen to us talk for you know a little over an hour, they understand that you know we both strongly believe in the role of hormones, but also the role of mindset into creating results. And so, you know, being able to dig into the mindset of your coach is important. Uh, you know, we have business resources on there as well. So, um, yeah, ncicertifications.com is the place to check that one out. Um, and then just for, you know, for more on me, it's just the in3nutrition.com. That's the coaching company that I own. Um, and they, you know, obviously they can hit me up there anytime with any questions around their own prescriptions or, or prescriptions that they're creating as well. Happy to answer. Right. Those. So you're, you're training people to be coaches and you're also coaching people in their nutrition day to day. Yes, sir. Awesome, man, dude, you're doing awesome stuff and I'm truthfully grateful for our friendship, man. So for those listeners that don't know, dude, yeah. I'm so humble. Oh, thanks, like man. people don't know, like I, I get to geek out a little bit on your podcast right now, but like. I was I was a Ben Pack fan for so long, <laughs> Thanks, man. and like I I remember, dude, like when you worked with Hani, I had actually kind of I was doing some work with Hani too, and I was like, oh, like I told Hani, you gotta introduce me, and I like I I ran into you at a show in Florida, and you were like the nicest guy in the world, and you, I mean you definitely have zero recollection because you met ten million people, but like you were the nicest guy back then. Like you, I don't know. Where was the shot? Dude, I definitely remember meeting you. I just don't remember if it was at a show. You were with some – it, it wasn't a show. I want to say it was the Tampa show. Uh, you were with a company that didn't, it didn't last long. But like they had like that shaker where it was like a pre-workout on like one half and like post-workout. Well, that would have been the 2000 – that would have been the 2010 Tampa Pro. That's probably no, yeah, what Yeah, because I was. competed there in 2009. Yeah, that's also yeah. the show where I met my wife. There you go. Um, but yeah, man, that was a big show, man. I met two important people. <laughs> so that was the first time, but dude, I always was a fan and just been really humble. And, and like, you know, the more that I get to converse with you and see like how just aligned we are in everything, man, I'm so grateful, so humbled and, and just really, really appreciate everything you're doing, dude. Um, the world needs the intelligence piece. I love what you're doing. Thanks, man. And so, so you can get behind my movement because I know you've got a huge, huge reach. And I often have just begun talking about this on my podcast. I mean, I, I'm getting behind the um, the uh, the movement to remove single-use plastics from our day-to-day -day life. Like I'm going to be the guy who's going to be like crazy OCD about not using plastic in my life. And I'm, I'm trying to – it's a big shift, man. You realize that you just look around and there's plastic everywhere. So it's particularly single-use plastic. So – um, you know, I, I'll, my supplement companies are all going to be uh, eliminating single-use plastics. I'm removing it from my day-to-day -day life, so no water bottles, no Tupperwares, uh, even what, uh, insofar as uh, plastic bags is a big thing, but even insofar as like paying attention to what I buy at a grocery store, you know, if you have the option between buying a glass and, and a plastic, I'm buying, pl I'm buying glass because, uh, dude, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pacific, you know, recycle or the Pacific plastic patch in the Pacific Ocean. It's ridiculous. So look it up. And, uh, you know, I like to give a little shout out to this thing on every podcast. And I know you have a huge reach. And and, and if you look it out, if you look it up, it'll, it'll you'll you'll know what I mean when you say, like, we, we got to make it. I can tell you, like, having been out in California several times lately, man, there's a big movement. So I'm going to dig more into it. And uh, I will I will pay that forward, my man, and make sure that goes out on man, my podcast there's, as there's well. A, so garbage deposit of plastic in the middle of the pacific ocean that, that is minimum the size of texas but maximum the size of russia and it's subjective because it's always moving but that's obscene men and like i didn't know that until maybe three months ago and like i can't let my kids take a world when i leave that is worse off than when i got here like we got to fix this and so so with my supplement companies now uh, all two dollars of every purchase is going toward donating to cleaning that up i'm getting away from plastics altogether with the companies we're going to switch over to you know uh, recyclable materials or not even recyclable but you know things that actually are compostable or reusable so getting away from this damn yeah. plastic stuff yeah i love it dude well i will Nobody. i will pay that forward i will uh i will look into it i mean i'm out here on the west coast now so I'll look more into it, but um, man, I, again, like I, that just shows, dude. Like where you're at, and like paying it forward in a cause like that. That's dope. Like that. That says everything anyone needs to know about you. Thanks, man, dude. I appreciate you, man. I'm, I'm so grateful for you coming on the show, and so are our listeners, man. So let's connect again soon. Always, brother. You got it. Join us on BenPokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life.
This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and in products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.